Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this is a video for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. In this video, we're going to look at Chapter 4 of our book on early childhood and the final section, which is the development of gender roles and gender typing in early childhood. Um, gender role stereotypes, uh, beliefs about them and the ways that they influence behavior, these things develop in stages. First thing is that children learn to label the sexes, what you know identifies someone as male or female. They also uh, then display knowledge of gender stereotypes for toys and clothing and work and activities. They then become increasingly traditional in their stereotyping of activities, jobs, and personality traits. So things, for instance, such as cruel and repairs broken things, as shown in the slide, can be viewed as masculine. And uh, traits like often afraid, cooks and bakes, seen as feminine. Of course, what we have here is a female soldier um, to which goes against some of the common stereotypes. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that both boys and girls uh, show a, a, a marked preference for their own gender and see their own gender in a better light. Um, so we have another question about play and about aggression. And so the question here is, why are children uh, aggressive? Why are boys more aggressive? Why are some children more aggressive than others? And Girls and boys differ in their preferences for gender stereotype toys, uh, generally by 18 months of age, and they also show their preferences for play environments and activities. So girls are more likely to do things like arts and crafts and play house and play with smaller groups or one-on-one -on -one play. Um, on the other hand, boys show a relatively greater preference for vigorous activities. They spend more time in larger groups and in competitive play. And again, these are general differences, and it's going to vary a lot from kid to kid. Um, now, about aggression and empathy. Boys show more aggression uh, than girls, most likely because of higher testosterone levels, but we need to be very specific. We're talking about physical aggression here. Uh, we'll talk more about it uh, later. Uh, there are many different kinds of aggression. There's social aggression, There's uh, which actually is more common among girls, where you have the queen bee situation in schools, where social exclusion can be a prototypically uh, female version of aggression that can be just as damaging as the physical aggression that boys show. Um, we'll say more about that later. But boys show more physical aggression, and girls are more likely to show uh, more empathy than boys, um, also because of girls' lower uh, aggression levels. And Again, these are general differences, and we want to talk about some of the theories behind why there are gender differences. So, for instance, we just want to talk about gender typing in general. Here we have our, our female on the left and our male on the right. So, gender typing is just the process of developing stereotypical masculine and feminine behavior patterns. So, there's several different perspectives on this. One, for instance, is that the evolutionary perspective, so that's natural selection, says that men's traditional roles as hunters and as, as the case may be as warriors and women's uh, common roles as caregivers and gatherers so you have the hunters and gatherers um, have, were stable for enough places for a long enough time to really become uh, something that was imprinted in our genes and then based on this perspective this evolutionary perspective men are better suited well let me rephrase this men's personality characteristics um, the stereotypical ones are well suited to things like hunting and like fighting um, because of the uh, physical attributes that got passed on uh, since a long time. And also, by the same theory, women are genetically predisposed in general, again, to be a little more empathic, a little more nurturing, since these characteristics enhance the success of their children. In fact, that gets into what's called the parental investment model. It's a pretty complicated thing, but the basic idea here is that... Um, women always know that they are the mother of their own children. On the other hand, because we have what's, you know, an internal uh, conception and concealed, men do not have the same surety, the same certainty of, of parenthood. Um, again, I think way back when, caveman days. And, um, and what you find is also that the amount of time that it takes for a woman to have a child is relatively long. Nine months of pregnancy, then several years of childbearing, whereas the amount of the minimum amount of time required for a man to have a child, you know, is a minute or two. You know, it's 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 just a tiny amount of time, which is why, for instance, um, the most children ever had by one woman back in the 1700s, Mrs. Um, 
is 69, which really is extraordinary, but you know, it's nothing close to the record for men, which is over 800. Um, that was, by the way, it was the king of Thailand. Um, anyhow, because women are much more invested in their children, I mean, literally, because they can only have so many children and it takes a lot more effort on their part, they tend to uh, engage a lot more in their children, spend a lot more time, and be more concerned about them. That's the theory. Whereas, because men, you know, really, kids can be sort of a dime a dozen, and they, um, and they don't really know for sure if a particular child is theirs, there's less of an investment. Again, the, the actual parental investment model is much more sophisticated and subtle than that and not doesn't engage, engage in so many gross stereotypes. Also, you find that prenatal brain organization can make a difference. So testosterone in the brains of male fetuses seems to spur greater growth in the right hemisphere, which is associated with visual and spatial tasks, and slow the growth on the left hemisphere, which is associated with verbal tasks. And so the increased size of the right hemisphere can contribute to the relatively greater visual and spatial abilities of men as a group. Um, on the other hand, women's relatively larger left hemisphere can contribute to their relatively superior verbal abilities. Again, as a group. And men and women may even differ in how they use their hemispheres. For instance, men may use the hippocampus in both hemispheres when navigating, while women seem to use the one in the right hemisphere and their right prefrontal cortex. That's interesting. Also, you find that there's a difference in mirror neurons, which facilitate the mirroring or mimicking of others, that these can also contribute to gender differences in aggression behavior in preschool age children. Also, sex hormones. When exploring the link between sex hormones and gender typing, researchers have found some tentative evidence. For instance, one study found a positive correlation between fetal testosterone and masculine type play. Other studies have shown that children display gender type preferences at very early ages, sometimes even as early as three to eight months. So that might be hormonal. So these are some of the biological influences. Now let's take a look at some of the psychological theories of gender typing. So, for instance, the first one we're going to look at is psychodynamic. That's Freud. And Freud explained the, the development of gender type behaviors in terms of identification with the same gender parent. So, as a result, the child came to develop preferences and behavior patterns typically associated with that gender. On the other hand, the cognitive developmental theory. Um, for instance, uh, Kohlberg, Lawrence Kohlberg proposed a cognitive development or view of gender typing in which children form concepts about gender and then fit their behavior to the concepts. He believed it involved the emergence of three major concepts. Gender identity, the knowledge that one is male or female. Gender stability, the understanding that people retain their gender for a lifetime. And gender constancy, the understanding that people's gender doesn't change despite uh, changes in clothing or, or particular behaviors. There's also the social cognitive theory. And this theory views identification as a continuous learning process in which rewards and punishments influence children to imitate uh, the adult models of their same gender. Finally, there's gender schema theory. And according to this theory, once children come to see themselves as male or female, they begin to seek information concerning gender type traits and try to live up to them. This view claims that gender identity alone can inspire gender appropriate behavior. And obviously, we're going to have a lot more to say about that as we talk about adolescence and adulthood. And anyhow, that finishes chapter four, early childhood.